Thank you all for your patience. I'm delighted that so many of you are here and joining us this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our event now. If you're just joining, my name is Trent Walker. I'll be your host today. I am currently a postdoc of the Host Center for Buddhist Studies at Stanford University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, workshop, part of the TT and WF Chow workshops and conferences series here at the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies at Stanford. And our workshop this morning, if you're here in California or this afternoon on the East Coast, this evening, if you're joining us from Europe or very late at night, if you're joining us from Southeast Asia, is on Buddhist bilingualism, Pali Vernacular Sermons, Exegesis, and Literature in Early Modern Thailand. So I believe that those of you who've registered for the workshop uh, would have received the copy of the handout uh, already. Um, if you haven't yet, let me just take a moment now to uh, share that over the chat. Thank you for your patience. So the handout uh, has now been attached and sent through the chat feature. It's a Google Drive link. So if you don't have it already, you can download it there. Otherwise, you should have received it over email. And that, as you saw before, contains uh, excerpts and key points from our three presenters uh, talks uh, today. So it provides some basis for us all to engage with and ask more questions of the presenters so that we can learn more deeply on this subject of uh, Buddhist bilingualism in early modern Thailand. So I will uh, say more and give a proper introduction to each of our three panelists before uh, each of their talks. Uh, we'll, the first talk will be by Dr. Atsani Punrak, uh, the second by uh, Dr. Jiranai Vichit Kun and the third by Dr. Tosopon Sipum. And before their three talks, I will I'll give a short overview uh, towards how to we might think about the relationship between Buddhism and bilingualism, particularly in the Thai context as a way of setting up some background for the, the three talks. After each talk, we'll have time for specific Q&A tied to that talk. And then at the conclusion of the event, we'll also have time for some general discussion. So at the moment, the Zoom event is set up so that um, everyone's on mute. Uh, but when it comes time for questions, you'll be able to raise your hand and I'll be able to unmute you. And then also through the, you can always ask questions through the chat feature. So, uh, Thank you again. If you have any questions about the event, you can write to me or you can also uh, send a chat message to Dr. Irene Lin, who is here uh, as the executive director of the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies. Many thanks to her and also to Stephanie Lee for making uh, today's event possible. So as you know, the relationship between Buddhism and bilingualism is quite important for thinking about the history of Theravada Buddhism in Thailand and in across the Theravada world more generally. And when we consider this term bilingualism, or in some cases to think about multilingual forms of uh, religious expression, texts, practices, and the like, we can think about several different ways of approaching uh, this use of two or more languages. So one is to think through uh, bilingual and multilingual authors, scribes, preachers, and listeners sort of across the Theravada Buddhist world, those who were producing texts, who were copying them onto new manuscripts, who were preaching them, who were reciting them in other contexts, who were listening to those performances, were themselves often uh, 
uh, familiar with, skilled, proficient in multiple languages. Certainly their local uh, native vernacular language, often other related uh, dialects that were important in the course of their life. Uh, oftentimes, many people are familiar with a scriptural language like Pali or have uh, some way of relating to languages like Sanskrit and other languages that are part of the broader Theravada milieu. Another way of thinking about the relationship between Buddhism and bilingualism is to consider the relationship between in the Theravada setting. So in particular, we might think about the relationship between scriptural languages on the vernacular, particularly the, the influence of Pali and, and Sanskrit in some cases on the development of certain forms and structures in vernacular languages. And one of our uh, presenters uh, today, uh, Atsani uh, Punrak, his uh, fantastic PhD dissertation is on this very subject in Thai, how certain uh, Thai expressions, Sam Nuan Pasa, in Thai uh, literature developed through the very direct influence of parallel structures in Pali and Sanskrit. We can also think about the reverse case in which vernacular languages exert their influence on the construction and composition and editing and transmission of texts in canonical languages like Pali. And this is something that indeed, again, another one of our presenters, uh, Tiranai Vitirkun, uh, her fantastic uh, PhD dissertation, also from Dulalongkorn uh, University, is on uh, one aspect of this subject, particularly through the text that she'll share with us more today, the Mahayutta Karavangsa that shows very clear signs of uh, Siamese or Thai grammatical and lexical influence on the creation of this text in Pali. So that's another way we can think about the, this connection between Buddhism and uh, bilingualism. Another way is to think about the interaction of languages across time and space. And this is something that uh, scholars working on Pali as well as Sanskrit across South and Southeast Asia have given a lot of attention to over the past two decades. We might think of the work of Sheldon Pollock on his notion of the Sanskrit cosmopolis. Um, we might think of the ways in which Anne Blackburn's book, particularly in her, her book, Locations of Buddhism, articulates a space for um, Pali as a cosmopolitan, uh, language linking South and Southeast Asia, linking Lanka and mainland Southeast Asia. We might uh, consider also the ways that the Pali imaginaire in, in the work of Stephen Collins or uh, the way that uh, Peter Skilling frames Pratmali or the world of Pali scriptures in the Thai context, which he frames as a, a data bank uh, from which uh, ideas and texts and practices can be drawn are part of the what we might think of as the world making effects of these cosmopolitan languages. And of course, their interactions with uh, local languages as, as well. And that's a process that's happening across space and how we frame the civilizational interaction between uh, Indic worlds and Southeast Asian worlds in particular as well as uh, happening across time when we consider uh, ideas like the, uh, the vernacular uh, millennium as uh, put forth by, by Sheldon Pollock to show the ways in which particular vernacular forms emerged at different points in history and what this tells us about the relationship between languages. There's lots more to explore on these subjects, particularly with regards to the Theravada Buddhist tradition. Another angle that we could take on the relationship between Buddhism and bilingualism is one, again, that will show up in some of the presentations that we'll learn from today. And that is in connection with bilingual or indeed multilingual texts. 
uh, whether those are structured as you know, parallel texts uh, across languages, uh, whether within a single manuscript, particularly in the case of, say, or a ritual or a spell manual that might combine multiple languages together, whether in a more modern context, the emergence of dual language books in a uh, front back format or in a page by page uh, format, allowing you know, multiple languages to be able to be present within a single book or in the particular format that I'll talk a little bit more about now, that of bi-text, of bilingual text, whether arranged in an interlinear, that is line by line, or interphrasal, that is phrase by phrase, word by word, sentence by sentence format. And again, in some of our presentations today, we'll see uh, the ways in which this form and this relationship between Buddhism and bilingualism is particularly important. In the uh, broader sort of linguistics context, this term uh, by text is used to refer to a bilingual presentation of a text that includes both a source text in one language and its translation into another. And we can also apply this term specifically to the South and Southeast Asian context, even more specifically to the Theravada Buddhist context in particular, to think about Indic vernacular by texts as bilingual presentations of a text that combine portions in an Indic prestige language, that is Pali or Sanskrit, and a, a local vernacular, whether that's Arakanese or Burmese or Mon or Shan or Thai or Lana or Lao or Vietnamese or Khmer or other languages, Singhala, other languages that might be used typically again in this interphrasal or interlinear format. So what might that look like on the page? Typically in a manuscript form, it might be to an untrained eye hard to distinguish which portions are in what language, but a few manuscripts use different colors or different scripts to make the bilingualness of the manuscript particularly apparent to us. So if we look at the two examples on the bottom of the page here, the one on the left is an example uh, from an interphrasal Pali Siamese by text, in this case of the Nantho Panandasur Kamluang. This is actually the text that was this, the, the subject of one of our panelists, um, Asani Punrak's uh, wonderful MA thesis from 2012, which was an extensive investigation into this text. And some of the manuscript forms that survive use uh, red uh, Kambali uh, script for the portions in Pali and use black uh, Thai-ya uh, script for the portions in, in vernacular Siamese or Thai. We also see an interlinear presentation of a bi-text on the right here where there are inked annotations in green, in this case in uh, Tam Lao uh, script. This particular uh, manuscript was annotated in Lien Zhan, uh, but the underlying uh, text was actually brought to Laos uh, from uh, central Thailand or from Cambodia during the colonial period. And so by texts are also part of these uh, transnational circulations, uh, both on a uh, the level of the, the textual material, but also even on a material level as well. And it's similar kinds of small, uh, uh, very detailed annotations that we might get a glimpse of in uh, uh, Dr. Tiranai's uh, presentation because they, they show up in the particular manuscript uh, that uh, she is looking at for this Maha Yutta Karavangsa text. Geographically speaking, these forms of bi texts appear in uh, Sri Lanka as well as across uh, the, the Theravada worlds of uh, mainland Southeast Asia, including in Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, uh, portions of Yunnan province in China, of uh, certain southern provinces in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, as well as uh, in the border areas of Bangladesh. In terms of the historical evidence for such texts, let me just uh, focus in on the, the Thai examples here. So in terms of Sanskrit, Siamese uh, manuscripts, the oldest example is uh, that of the Supriti Thamaracha Chado Kamluang of a Sanskrit Siamese uh, by text uh, dated to the 16th, uh, sorry, 17th to 18th uh, century. 
um, with the text appearing in an 18th century uh, manuscript. Um, in terms of the uh, the earliest uh, known Pali Siamese by text, a very influential uh, composition, the Mahathat Kam Luang, of which certain portions of uh, the six sort of surviving uh, you know, original chapters of it are thought to date to 1482, at least according to the uh, Royal Chronicles. This is again the uh, Mahathat Kam Luang, um, which was a key influence for all kinds of later compositions, both in the particular Kam Luang genre uh, that we may learn about later, but also from the uh, Pali Siamese by texts in general. The terms that are used to describe these texts vary across different languages. Just to focus on the Thai examples, occasionally uh, this word misai is used, but it's more common to hear words such as ple yok sap, ple doi payan chana, dunia bot, kam luang, in this case a genre term, but one that it refers exclusively to these kinds of uh, Sanskrit Siamese or Pali Siamese by text. And these terms are quite heterogeneous. There's no one term to refer to all of these different forms. And they generally highlight particular techniques, whether of parsing, in the case of Junia Bot, uh, whether of the act of rearrangement in this term, Ple uh, Yoksap, or in the act of gloss using a particular uh, form of gloss in this term, uh, and again, I would encourage you to look at the work of uh, Dr. Asani in both his MA thesis and his uh, doctoral dissertation goes into considerable detail how this distinction between uh, or uh, this very hyper literal style of translation uh, between Pali and Thai and uh, the more natural style of Blay Doi Ap works. The texts that we'll be hearing about from our presenters are largely from the uh, most recent dynasty in Thailand, that of the uh, Ratanakosin period. And this is the period in which uh, the modern day city of uh, Bangkok is the, the capital and the site of the royal palace from 1782 uh, to the present. So the presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Asani will be from a text from in the middle part of this era, late uh, 19th, early 20th century. I'm, I may be misremembering that from the reign of King Rama the, the V. Um, the presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Tiranai will be dealing with the text from the early Ratanakosin period, um, ascribed to Stomde Praponarat, um, an important uh, monk of uh, the early uh, part of this era. Prior to that, there was a, uh, a short uh, Tonburi period, and then the preceding uh, period we refer to as the Ayutthaya period, and the particular sermon texts that uh, Dr. Tosopon will be presenting to us on some of those uh, date from the end of the Ayutthaya period and went through series of modifications and changes and developments uh, throughout the Ratanakosin period. Let me just, as in by way of closing here, give a few last uh, pictures and examples of some of these different kinds of bitex. So in the case of an interlinear example, we might expect to see these very small uh, annotations in a particular script known as Kam Wat, um, this abbreviated form of Kam or the version of Cambodian script used in Thailand. Uh, and in this uh, form, the annotations provide uh, select glosses as well as letters and numbers to be able to rearrange the Pali text into a vernacular word order. So again, we see this particular kind of relationship between Pali and vernacular developing. Another way we can think about these texts is through them being developed through a particular set of techniques. So. I won't talk about all of these now, but just to highlight some that will show up within the course of the presentations in our workshop. 
in some cases, the poly that may show up in a bilingual poly Siamese text is cited from an existing poly text. So for instance, in the case of Dr. Tsosupon's presentation, the poly text of the both the root verses of the Mahavasantra Jataka, as well as the commentarial narrative portions in the Atakata, uh, are um, the portions that are cited in these uh, bilingual sermons. Uh, we'll learn then in the uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Atsani uh, that in some cases, the Pali might be invented, that is composed expressly for the purpose of a given uh, bi-text. Then in terms of the presentation, this is skipping to the bottom of this slide. Uh, in some cases, these bi-texts are tailored for uh, lay audiences for certain kinds of narrative or didactic or entertaining sermons. And this is certainly the case uh, that we might uh, see in um, Tosopon's uh, presentation around the use of Motle Teet Mahachat, these ways of uh, chanting and reciting melodically uh, from the Mahavasantra Javaka. Uh, we also may see ways in which um, by text may be constructed as a kind of uh, belle lettre, as a form of aesthetic uh, literature, often tailored for elite circles. We see this in some forms of literature within the Kamluang uh, genre, for, for instance, in one of the uh, late Kamluang uh, texts, the Pranon Kamluang. Um, we also uh, perhaps uh, see this in the text that um, uh, that. Atsani will present uh, to us today as our, our first presentation. Each of these forms of bi-text uses uh, you know, different techniques in order to make this relationship between poly and vernacular clear uh, to the reader in some way. And that's what I've sort of offered here in the middle of the slide in terms of these techniques of analysis. So if we take an example from an interphrasal uh, by text, this is from the Mangala Sutta, this very important um, uh, Pritta or protective chant in the Theravada tradition. Uh, the, we can see the different stages that a Pali text might go through before it ends up here on the bottom of the screen in in a bitextual form that involves aspects of being first cited and then parsed into its constituent portions, maybe uh, amplified so that phrases uh, such as evang are rendered as eke na karena, the phrases such as me, uh, by me, are clarified uh, by bhavato samukha, by me, who is uh, in the presence of the Blessed One, etc. So these kinds of amplifications, and at the bottom of the, the slide here, uh, rearrangement, uh, provide uh, ways of unpacking a kind of syntactical and grammatical and even lexical relationship between poly and vernacular worlds. And so some of these techniques will be present in the, the presentation. Some uh, we won't be discussing so much today, but I just wanted to raise it as one angle for thinking about the relationship between the kinds of uh, poly texts that our presenters will be uh, discussing and the ways those are interacting uh, with the vernacular, whether it's in the form of a, a bilingual text that we'll see from Asani and from Tosopon, or whether it's in the form of a polytext that shows very distinct influences from the vernacular, as we'll learn from Giranai in her presentation. So uh, the first talk uh, will be from uh, Dr. Atsami Punrak on bitextualizing Tetsana Ryong Nihan Mika Tura. And he'll, of course, uh, describe more about what's happening here, but it's a, a fascinating example of the way a, uh, in this case, a comic, uh, you know, opera in English, the Mikado, is brought into this poly Siamese format through a, a royal composition of uh, King Dulalangon. Uh, then uh, we'll have a chance to hear from Tiranai Vititkun on her uh, work on this uh, 
really quite remarkable uh, Pali uh, composition from the early Ratanakosin period, the Mahayutakara Vangsa, uh, with its parallels in Burmese, Mon, and, and Thai uh, literature, and particularly looking at what kinds of distinct uses of Pali appear in this text. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Tosupon uh, Pum on the uh, functions of the Pali um, gatha, these phrases that are cited uh, from the root text and the commentary of the Vasanthara Jataka and the interplay between those and thinking about textuality and orality in this uh, sung or chanted sermon format of Te Et Maha Chai. So I'll just put up this big bibliography slide for the, the sake of the, the video uh, later on. You can see some of the work of uh, the presenters uh, there uh, listed as well that you might want to follow up on. But as we move through the presentations today, sort of the bigger questions that I'm trying to keep in mind are, what does the interaction between Pali and Thai uh, in these bi-texts, or you know, even in the case of a monolingual uh, Pali text that has received influence from Thai, tell us about the nature of Buddhist composition and translation writ large. In other words, how do we take the lessons of what we're learning today in a very specific Thai context into a broader Buddhist studies context? How might we place the Siamese innovations in a, a regional context? In other words, what kinds of influence do we see between what's happening in Siam and that is in central Thailand in this period with other places in, in South and Southeast Asia? You know, particularly we might look to Laos and, and Cambodia for influence of influence from Siamese examples. And what is uh, Buddhist uh, about these specific modes of textuality and bilingualism displayed in the material? And this is a question that we we ought to think about in particular with regards to the first uh, uh, presentation from from Asani, but I think is quite relevant for the other uh, panelists as well. Like what makes this specific way of engaging with text and language Buddhist or is it Buddhist at all? Is this, are we forcing a label on it that doesn't need to be there necessarily? So uh, without further ado, I'd like to proceed to our first uh, presentation. Um, this, again, will be by Dr. Um, Atsani Punrak, and let me give a, a brief uh, introduction to him. I already mentioned um, some of the contributions that his, his published work, as well as his MA and PhD dissertation, have had um, on the field of, of scholars working in, in Thailand and, and beyond, but let me say just a little bit more. So he holds a PhD in Thai literature from Dula Longon University, and his uh, dissertation that I mentioned from 2019, Expressions in Thai Literature in Relation to Expressions in Pali and Sanskrit Literature, written in Thai, uh, offered the first detailed analysis of the many uh, Pali and Sanskrit uh, loan translations found in uh, Thai language and literature. Excuse me. Uh, and he's been working now as a lecturer in the Department of Thai Faculty of Arts at Dulalongon University since 2018. His research interest includes uh, Thai literature translated and adapted from Pali and Sanskrit, especially Pali Thai literary uh, by texts and also literary stylistics that we, again, um, uh, I and others have learned so much from in his work. His uh, current project engages uh, the Thai literary adaptation of Indic tales about the demonic uh, spirits known as Vaitala or uh, Vaitban uh, in Thai. So really looking forward to learning from that new work as well. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Atsani, for, for joining us this morning. Uh, the, the floor is yours. Um. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Trent, for uh, your generous introduction. Um, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Re Dr. Lee, for, uh, for uh, the invitation. Um, I am very honored to be invited to, to take part in this uh, workshop. Um, yes, uh, when talking about uh, the, the Pali Thai by text. Uh, uh, there are numerous Pali Thai by text 
in the uh, Thai literary repertoire, um, let alone the other genre of uh, uh, Pali Thai by text. Um, but uh, today, uh, I chose to talk about uh, 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 a less, uh, a less uh, known uh, Pali Thai by text, uh, that is Tesana Ryanitanikatura, uh, a work of King Jalalungon. Um, the reason why I, I chose this text is that um, you said, uh, this is an interesting uh, with this literary work in early modern science. Uh, this work is an adaptation of a comic opera. Uh, it was turned into uh, a Tesana genre. So uh, we will learn from, the, from this text about the, the real the interrelation between uh, uh, the incorporation between uh, the Pali and uh, Thai text from 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 uh, from Tesana uh, Renitamikatura. Um, Please, may I interrupt one sec, uh, uh, Ajahn Atsani? Would it be possible to uh, do the oh, slide sorry. view? No, no problem. Thank you so much. Sorry, I forget to to to. Uh, to uh, use the full screen mode. Okay, now I have uh, divided my talk into two parts. The first part, uh, I will talk briefly about the background of Tesana Renitanika uh, uh, And then I, I will analyze uh, the presentation technique used in the, in the Tesana Renitanika And I will conclude uh, my talk uh, um, my talk should last about uh, 25 or 30 minutes. And after my talk, uh, uh, any comments or questions is welcome. Or if you have any questions or comments, you can uh, you can send me via the chat box. So I will uh, uh, answer it or take it after my presentation. Okay, can you hear me clearly? Or you will, uh, do you want me to speak louder? Your voice is coming through very clear. Thank you. Okay. Now let's move to the first point, the background of Tesana uh, Mikatura. Uh, Tesana Mikatura uh, is an adaptation of uh, a comic opera by uh, Gilbert and Sandilan, the Mikado. Yes, and um, yes, uh, uh, the man on the left is uh, William Gilbert, and on the right, Arthur Sullivan. Yes, he composed uh, the opera in 1885, and uh, the story is set in uh, ancient Japan. Yes, the story is about the crown prince who is forced by his father, King Mikado to marry an old lady. So he flees from his father and uh, he flees in disguise as a minstrel and uh, to uh, a vassal state of uh, his father. Uh, there he falls in love with uh, uh, Yam Yam and a young lady, Yam Yam. But unfortunately, uh, Yam Yam is going to marry Goto. Uh, the father's civil servant. So uh, he, he is very sad, but uh, uh, with his wit, uh, he uh, eventually uh, manages to marry Yam Yam. Yes, this is the synops synopsis of, uh, of the story. And this is the, 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 the scene from the, the Mikado. <coughs> So sorry if I uh, I cough because I just re recovered from the COVID nineteen. So when I talk, uh, I sometimes I cough. So please uh, forgive me. How the Mikado was turned into Tesana um, uh, History has it that in eighteen ninety, King Chulalongkorn, uh, together with his company, visit Singapore. And uh, he has a chance to watch the opera, the Mikado. Uh, the Mikado was performed in front of him and his company. 
and the following years in 1891, uh, King Vashira Wood, who was then the Cow Prince, um, uh, accompanied him to, uh, uh, to the Sichang Island. Uh, and there, uh, his Thai teacher, uh, his English teacher assigned the Crown Prince to translate the Mikado libretto into Thai as a part of his uh, English course. Yes. And then the Crown Prince translation was edited and revised by his teacher, Paya uh, Itzrapan Sohon. And one day, uh, King Junalungpon uh, happened to see the, re the revised version. And he think, uh, he said that uh, the revised version was, uh, it was like a sermon. So uh, he was amused by, uh, by the revised version. So he decided to, uh, to compose or to rewrite it into a real sermon. So this is how the, the, the Mikado is uh, turned into the Tesana Rinitan Gatura. Yes, it is uh, the front cover of uh, Tesana Rinitan Gatura when it was first published. Um, you can uh, uh, read it online in the, uh, the Sulalungkon uh, Library website. Uh, what is important here is that uh, when the king uh, decide decides to, uh, to to rewrite it into the into a real sermon, uh, it means that uh, the the Thai sermon genre frame the composition of Tesana uh, Renitamikatura. Uh, when the uh, the king used the salmon chong to uh, to compose the tesana rim katura, uh, it affect it affects uh, the story uh, 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 in terms of characters and setting. Uh, uh, you know the the story was uh, turned into uh, with this narrative. Uh, to sound like or something like a Chataka or Thammapada stories. And this also affects the names of the characters and the press names in the story. For example, um, the, the King Mikado became uh, Mikatura Racha or Mikatura Ra. Uh, uh, Nankipu, uh, the name of the crown prince, became Nankipura or uh, Japan uh, became uh, Chipana Tipa, uh, the island of Chipana and Tokyo. Tokyo became uh, Tokiya Nakara or the, the city or the, uh, the city of uh, Tokyo. Uh, this means that uh, this when the king uh, turned uh, the Mikado into a sermon, Chong, um, uh, the 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 proper names uh, was uh, localized, were localized uh, to sound like the Pali uh, Sanskrit look Sanskrit loan words. Yes, but apart from the character and the setting, the theme also was also affected by the the the, the frame of uh, the sermon chong. Um, why the Mikado is a comic opera. Tesana Rinikatura became a Buddhist literary work. It became and became a serious joke with uh, uh, the concept, uh, the Buddhist concept. The king incorporated the Buddhist concept into the story. Uh, he uh, composed uh, how he used the uh, kata to. Uh, at length, at the concluding part of the story, to uh, to teach the Buddhist concept to the reader or the listeners, and the most important part that we will focus today is the presentation of the text when he 
use the salmon chong to uh, compose Tesana Rung Mika, Nika Mika Ra. It affects the presentation uh, into, into categories. The first one is uh, the king employed a, the court sermon format, which is in itself a by text, and he presents it in the by text format. So we will talk about these two uh, aspects of the, the, of the uh, Tesana Rung Mika Mika Ra. Let's start with the first one. The, the, the presentation of Tesana uh, Rimikan uh, Katura by using the court sermon format. Uh, uh, when, when we talk about the court sermon format, uh, uh, there are many uh, characteristics of the court sermon format. The first one that was employed in the composition is uh, the citing of the Pali source text, but in this case, uh, the Pali source text is not uh, is not cited, uh, but it was invented to be cited later. Uh, and then, after citing the invented Pali source text, uh, the king uh, employed the introdu introductory formula, uh, and in this case, uh, the the, the re he. Re the requesting formula, uh, the uh, requesting the permission from the king for the, the delivering the sermon. This is the the, the, the characteristic one of the correct characteristic of uh, the, the court sermon format. And since the story is so long, uh, the text, uh, the sermon, the, the sermon was divided into chapters, and in this case. Uh, uh, the text is divided in three chapters of Ganda. And then uh, to summarize the story, the king uh, used uh, kata or the verse, the Pali verse at the end of the story to teach the Buddhist, the Buddhist concept. And when uh, concluding the story, uh, he used the concluding formula, A1 Gomi Devakarachani. This is the, 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 the concluding formula that usually found in the sermon in Thai, uh, in Thai context. Now, let me see the uh, example of these uh, of five techniques. The first one is the citing the invented Pali source text. Uh, this is the, the title of of the of the story, it reads Nithanakatha uh, Reung Mikapura Anima Nai Kampi Paristani of Opera. A story of Mikapura derived from the sacred book of Paris Paristani Opera. Um, here, uh, the king uh, claimed that uh, the story is taken from a sacred. Uh, sacred text named uh, Harris Stanley, ha ha Harris Stanley Opera, which is derived from uh, Harris Stanley Opera, which is the company who, who managed to perform the, the opera to the king. And after the title of the, of the story, uh, this is the, the invented Pali text. It reads, Atite Gira Chibanaki Pesu, Mika Nama Racha. Uh, if you know uh, Pali, this is the formula it, uh, of the story. Uh, it begins with Atite and Gira. Atite and Gira is a formula used to, uh, at the beginning of the story. Uh, um, uh, this text uh, was not, was not, uh, original text found in any Pali scriptures, but uh, the king had the text uh, composed for, for, for the sake of the composition. And uh, the, the, the meaning is in times past, then in Sipanak Island, uh, a king named Mikatura ruled in Tokiya city. 
His son, a 19 year old, was of perfect form, amiable, clever, and intelligent. Uh, this format can be found in, for example, Prapathoma uh, Sompotikata text, which is uh, uh, composed for, uh, for, 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 preach, for preaching uh, for the king. And since the text is uh, uh, the, the king imitates the, the court sermon text, uh, so the king has to use the uh, requesting formula in, in, in his composition because uh, the court sermon the court, the court sermon is used to preach uh, in front of the king. So the man who preached uh, the, the sermon has to request have to request the king to, to, to explain or to preach the sermon. And this is the request requesting formula. But now I will explicate the story. That's what uh, derived from the sacred book of Kalistani Opera. Uh, in terms of the, the division of the sermon into chapters, uh, as I told you earlier, the Tesana Remikatura consists of three chapters of Gandhat. And uh, the, the interesting point is that uh, the invented Pali source text was also cited at the beginning of each chapter. And also uh, the introdu introductory formula was employed in each chapter. For example, uh, at the beginning of the chapter, at the, of the second chapter, uh, uh, the king composed, but ni jada yi satsuna kwam tam nai harisatani opera su pai. Now I shall continue explicating the story from Haristani opera. Uh, the fourth technique uh, when uh, the king uh, composed. Uh, Pesanarunikukatura is citing katas or Pali words in order to teach the Buddhist concept. He quotes uh, the invented kata at length at the end of the story. This is the last kata uh, in the story. It reads, Machato ye wa atanan, apitapeya andito, atano sukama netang, yang we samanat. สมัครมายติซึ่งตั้งตนไว้ในสถานกลางซึ่งเป็นทางที่อาจจะนำความสุขอันประเสริฐมาให้แก่ตนนับภายหน้าด้วยประการชนีเอ่อ I translate this verse uh, with equanimity shall devise firmly take the road that might lead oneself in the future at the happiness to arrive the middle way principle should be followed by the wise as it will bring joy to oneself in the future. And the last techniques, uh, uh, the last characteristic of uh, the chong, uh, the, the sermon chong is the, the employing of, is the employment of concluding formula. Um, the concluding formula in Tesana Mikatura is the explanation of the sacred book of Paris Stanley Opera. Uh, and his, he, he cites uh, Pali Evang, which means in this way, has that end? Has that end? Okay, uh, so this five characteristic of uh, the the court sermon chong were found in the composition of Tesanara Mikantara. This means that uh, 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 the Thai sermon chong framed the composition uh, of the, the story. Uh, another uh, important point in the presentation of Tesanara Mikantara is uh, uh, the using of bitex format. Uh, if you read uh, the excerpt uh, in the handout, 
you will find that the, the text uh, uh, was presented bilingually. Uh, the process uh, that the king used uh, in uh, the composition of uh, this by text uh, consists of the three process. Uh, the first one is the invention of the Pali text at the Sudo, at the Sudo source text. Uh, the text consists of the prose Pali and uh, the verse and the verse. The prose, the prose was composed by uh, the king's uh, elder brother, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Sawati Prawat, Gromapa Samot Amon Pan. Unfortunately, we, we don't know, we have no evidence whether the prince composed the whole story because uh, the, the text we have, the, the published text we have, uh, uh, the text, uh, the Pali prose text uh, uh, was used at the beginning of each chapter. So we, we don't know if he composed the whole or he composed it sporadically. Um, but the kata, uh, as I have, as I said earlier, uh, the king uh, had the kata composed uh, at length, and the kata was composed by Phraya uh, Sikhinton Mohan, who is the Thai teacher, the famous Thai teacher. Uh, then, uh, this Pali text was very important because it was selected and cited. Uh, in the Thai text, uh, uh, the poet, the king, select words and phrase from the invented Pali text and place them into phrasally. Uh, so he imitates the, 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 the Baitic format, but in the reverse process, uh, 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 the in general, the, the, the Pali text come first and then uh, the translation in the local vernacular, but uh, here, the, uh, the Thai text comes first and the Pali text uh, was uh, composed, was invented after the, the Thai text. And after uh, selecting and uh, placing the this invented Pali text, uh, the king an uh, analyzed and translating the selected verse of phrases. But I, I think in this case, uh, uh, since the Pali source text was invented after the Thai text, uh, I, I would call this process, uh, I'm not sure if this word makes sense, uh, uh, I would call it the Pali Thai realignment, realignment, because uh, 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 it doesn't mean that the, the, the poet, the king, uh, have to translate the Pali word, but uh, the king have to place the, the Pali words or phrase to correspond to the, uh, the, the pre-existed Thai, uh, Thai text. And the realignment includes various techniques. And uh, I used uh, Dr. Trent, uh, uh, three main steps of uh, composing by text at the frame of uh, analysis of the uh, realignment techniques. The first one I found in the text is uh, the selecting verse of phrase uh, from the invented Pali uh, source text. Uh, in this excerpt, uh, you will notice that the, 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 the word apite uh, here was selected. And the second one is a kuna uisati so is uh, excited and, uh, and placed uh, into phrasally. Uh, only small percent of the Kali portion is uh, recited in in the text, so uh, this take uh, 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 is the the Pali text is uh, is not uh, uh, exist in 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 the text. Uh, the most uh, portion of the text is Thai, not the Pali. And the, the, the Pali Thai realignment technique one, the, the first technique that was employed in, in uh, the Tesanarimika is the grammatical annotation, grammatical annotation as uh, uh, 
generally found in uh, uh, Pali vernacular by text. For example, Rajaputto Anwa Parachabu. In this case, uh, the word Anwa is, the, is placed uh, in front of the, the translation, Parachabu. Anwa here is, is the grammatical markers of the nominative case. Uh, it means that the, uh, the Rajaputto functions as the, the, the subject of the verb of, in the active sentence. Another example is the use of uh, the number markers, Tang Lai in Thai. Although the, the Pali text is not, cite, it's not cited, but we can, uh, we, can uh, we know that uh, this trans the translation is, uh, is the translation of the Pali word. ชีปนะที่เปสุเอ่อมีพระมหากษัตริย์ทรงพระนามบัญญัติวิกาคือรากชีปนะที่เปสุเสวยไอสุริยะสมบัติกรุงโตวิยะนครในแว่นแขวน
uh, I think this rap study of the Tesana Renitanikatura reveals that Kinjana Lungkoi observed the bi-text conventional techniques in composing the text. Uh, this points to the fact that highly Thai bi-text composition techniques, uh, these techniques were the established convention. And this convention allowed the king to transform the comic opera into an interesting with this literary work. Thus, the Tesanare Nitamikatura is a good example of King Jodalungon poetic creativity and skillfulness. And moreover, uh, the convention of my text composition is one of, uh, I use the, the word, uh, the poetic resources in Thai literally culture that has long been playing a significant role in the cultivation of Thai literary culture. Um, yes, uh, at, at uh, the present day, at present day Thailand, uh, there are some uh, Thai writer who, uh, who use the, the Baitis format in composing the short stories. So this is a very interesting point that I think uh, it is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, is from the poetic resources of the uh, uh, by this, uh, composition convention. So thank you so much for uh, uh, your attention. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atsani, for that really wonderful presentation. I really appreciate the way you introduce for us this term polythai realignment to describe the process of what's happening, including one that involves, in this case, multiple authors preparing aspects of the poly text, and then the, the main author, the king in this case, placing them in the chosen places into the text. So you, you've really sort of revealed to us the the intricacies of the creation of, of these kinds of compositions. I have a few questions that I, I would like to ask you, but I, I really want to open it up to all of our audience members. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you. And you're also welcome to submit a question in the the chat. Um, so well, while we're waiting for uh, questions from the audience, if I, I'll just go ahead with one of my own here, um, uh, 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 if you don't mind. So the, f the first question I'd like to, to ask is simply, what happened to the humor in the, the text? Is the king's composition funny and enjoyable from the comedic aspect or is that entirely lost when it's put into this bitextual format? Um, thank you for your questions. Um, the text is still a humorous text, but as a user term, a, a serious joke. So it it is not only present as the 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 the, the, the humor, but it teaches us uh, the the Buddhist concept the the with the Buddha's Dharma at the end. So it is the, the, the composition uh, the, the, the uh, composition between the uh, humor and uh, a se uh, serious uh, Buddhist concept. So the humor is not completely lost in the in the, the, the transformation. Thank you. And that's that's fascinating to think about in the context of, say, the Santara Jataka sermon practices, Tate Mahachat in Thailand, which, as a number of people have explored, say, you know, writing in English, Catherine Bowie's work on humor and the politics of humor in the Vasantara Jataka show the many complex ways that that humor in this sermon format can come out. I think we will see a different dimension of that in, in the work of uh, Tosopon as well. Um, well, we're still waiting for questions here. Um, I, I had another one I wanted to ask you, and that was uh, just about the, the particular poly translations that are used for proper names in the text. So just to take an example of the way Japan 
is uh, translated as Jeepana Deepa. And the when this word is pronounced in uh, Thai pronunciation today, it becomes Chi Pana Tipa, uh, which gets you know further and further away from uh, whatever you know understanding of Japan, whether in, in this this English anglicized word Japan or from you know the, the the Thai form of Japan is Yippon, et cetera. So I, I would love to to hear more from you. Like why do you think this form uh jipana uh, was chosen? Does it reflect a Tamayutika Nikaya pronunciation of Pali such that something spelled Cha Chang Sala I Papla Nanu is understood to be pronounced as Jipana? instead of a ordinary or not so Mahanikai pronunciation of Pali as Chipana. I'm just curious what you think about what's happening phonologically here in these choice of transliterations. I, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, Jan Jir and I could answer this question better than me. But I think uh, uh, it is not about the, the, the Mahanikai or pronunciation, but it's about the 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 the, 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 the con convenience of Thai pronunciation. Yes, we, uh, because in Thai, for example, Zipana, we don't have the the voice ch as in Pali. So we have voiceless ch. Uh, we have a voiceless African ch sound. So uh, the the king or or the uh, the the, the the composer of the Pali text uh, used the the Chipana instead of the the Jipana. Uh, I think Ajahn Jiranai, could you please could you help me answer this question? Uh, any comment why uh, the, the pronunciation uh, shift from the, the Pali? Uh -huh. I'm not sure if this uh, up to the the pronunciation of the English word of Japan in, in, in that period because like uh like like some many English word or yeah in, in many English word is uh like pronounced differently from, from our pronunciation nowadays. So so like maybe the word Japan is pronounced as like like trying to mimic the sound as shibana. I'm I'm not sure about this. Is it any uh, evidence of the the text that uh been written by by King Chalongkorn and and call this country Zipana Zipana to to mimic the sound Japan earlier? I'm not sure about this. So, <laughs> may I have a, a suggestion? Please. Uh, yes. I, I Please. think because that this one maybe. One possible explanation is that uh, Thai people in in that time tends to to how do you say transliterate the, that word in the, the foreign words into the, the words that they are familiar or they have that like in Thai counterpart of like the close sound, the close pronunciation. Like in case of phosphorus, they turned it into fa supere, which each uh, syllable has meaning in Thai. But uh, in overall, when, when trying to, to use that word, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Th yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. Did you have more you wanted to add? Oh, it uh, looks like we have a question from uh, Christian Lamerts. Let me. Uh, Press ask to unmute and make sure this works. Are you able to unmute now? I think I'm unmuted. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead, Professor Lambert. Ajahn Atsani, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. And it's 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 really um, uh, delightful to see you, I mean, encouraging to see you working on sort of modern kind of uh, appropriations of this kind of method uh, in, in the case of um, this particular text. I mean, this is something we also see a great deal of in Burma during the colonial and post-colonial period, but you know there hasn't really been much attention paid to the use of um, 
you know, Nicia style outside of the context of um, kind of more conventionally kind of Buddhist textual production, right? But it's something that we find in Burma, for example, in journalism and magazine articles and things like that across a whole range of uh, topics. So that's quite um, interesting. I wanted to ask you a question about um, the, 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 the business about this, the source text versus the pseudo source text. And the, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the obvious fact in relation to this text that um, the Pali was composed, uh, I guess, after the vernacular version. Um, you know, and this is another thing that in the case of, of Burma, we have examples of, we have examples of um, these by texts that are produced sort of with the Pali and the vernacular simultaneously, um, sort of to create a composition that is a sort of, um, you know, distinctive uh, by text that doesn't really have a source text outside of itself, um, but kind of mimics that sort of gesture of invoking the source text. I mean, then we also have these cases where um, we have, such as the, the example that you're discussing, um, where we have a vernacular text that is later sort of, you know, kind of an operation is performed on the vernacular text and it's sort of, you know, carved up in various ways to make room for, um, you know, the poly portion, the Nisia portion, right? To create, to create a Nisia um, as, a, as a novel, unique sort of textual uh, uh, phenomenon. So I wanted to ask you about the, the kind of, um, I mean, you know, I don't know a great deal about this in the, in the case of, um, well, anywhere to the east of, of Burma, but, um, you know, the way that you presented it, it's, it sounded somewhat as though th this is kind of distinctive, what we see in this example, um, this, this kind of, this idea that the, that the bi-text, you know, the poly portions were sort of imposed on the vernacular after the event, right, as it were, after the vernacular had been composed. Um, so I'm wondering if, if, if there are earlier examples of this phenomenon in, in the history of kind of bitextual composition in, in Thailand, you know, where you have a vernacular text first, and then the poly is, you know, sort of applied, um, or if we have this example of um, the sort of uh, uh, simultaneous composition of the poly and the vernacular uh, together. Um, so if there's any, if there's any, you know, trace of that kind of history um, around uh, in, in Thailand or the, the general Thai region. Um, thank you so much for your questions. Um, I think a comparable situation, but not the same situation, a comparable is the the case of Panya Sachataka, Panya Sachataka, Panya Sachadok, or the upper cry for Chataka. Most of the Chataka in this collection was originally a, a fable or a, a local tales, and then it was translated into Pali, into Pali. So, uh, but, uh, I think the original uh, version is an oral version, not a written, not a written. So uh, the text is not uh, the, the, the written text, but uh, it's the, the oral story. And then it was uh, translated into Pali. And then again, it was retranslated into Thai uh, in written text. But this is a compar comparable situation, not exactly the same as the case of Tifana, Rumi Kamikakura. Ajahn Trent, can you think of the, 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 the other case that uh, like that is like the case of uh, Tifana, Rumi Kamikakura? Here I would ask Ajahn Tiranai if, if she has other examples that might be relevant. Yeah. yeah. Is is uh, it would be my presentation, but here, like uh, the Mahayagarwansa is a a work of translation from the Thai version of the of the the, the story. Oh, so, wow! Yes, but and the Mahayagarwansa is maybe the first uh, 
identify as a direct translation, but I'm not sure that Panyasa uh, Chataka is a translation or maybe Patom Sampotikata, Patom Sampot. Maybe it's it's not that that kind of a translation, but a a text that been written alongside with, with uh, the, the vernacular language and the, the Bali version. Mm. I think another example we could bring in here is this text, the Jetana Bheda or Jetana Bheda, that circulates in Thailand, in Laos, and Cambodia and that has a very similar compositional style to this Pali Siamese version of the Mikado. And in that case, the, the Pali portions seem to be invented, again, expressly for the Bai text, uh, and that the original stories are you know, vernacular stories. In this case, the um, number of different stories have been brought together, including aspects of the Bla Butong uh, narrative that's sh shared throughout Thai and Thai cultures in Southeast Asia and also in China. Um, so in that example, we see uh, this kind of uh, compositional process taking place. I hope that gives some set of answers that are useful for you, uh, Professor Lamerts. Um, so now we have a question from uh, Ajahn Chairat. So let me press X, ask to unmute. And hopefully Hi, I'm sorry, I have to turn off the camera. This is like already midnight here in Thailand. Um, <laughs> what do you do? Um, so I have, I think I will follow up on Trent's um, comment on the humor. Uh, it seemed to me that the tech, the translation just started off as a parody in a sense. Um, it's a kind of a parody of the um, how to say the, the, the kind of um, old-fashioned Pali translation. Um, it seemed like the humor is in the um, incompatibility between the, co the content and the form. Um, and I'm not sure is that, it seemed like the, the, the by making it a Pali, it's, o it's already like overdoing uh, to make it kind of comic or to render it com comic or, or humorous or something like that. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, probably uh, Ajahn Asani, I don't. I'm not sure if you want to comment on that. Um, what kind of attitudes the king might have, or about about the the a kind of archaic form of Pali or at the transition. I don't know. Um, you want to comment on that um, on the kind of parodic aspect of the translation? Is that um, you think it's uh, worth considering? I'm not sure. Um, yes, in my opinion, I think the king, at first, uh, he uh, reproachfully, uh, reproachfully uh, rewrote uh, uh, the text as a real sermon because he, he, he wanted to, uh, to, to compose a parody of the Pali Thai translation style. But I, I think uh, his intention was was not just to 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 make joke of the, the, the Pali Thai translation style, but he he also want to make it a serious joke. So I think uh, it both uh, have a, a it is both a parody and a Buddhist literature simultaneously. Mm. 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 Yeah, I think that's very interesting um, because um, but I haven't I haven't read through the text and I think it felt like it's very like parodic, but then the way that you presented that how detailed that he got into, it's very like serious, kind of serious um, translation also. So it's like humorous, but also very serious. Yes, um, I think the story is, 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 is it's not serious. It, it's just is humorous, but uh, uh, when uh, at the end of the story, he he quotes uh, he cites the kata, the, the verse at length, uh, and this makes the text uh, uh, also a serious uh, a serious joke, not only the the, the parody. I think. Thank you. I think I can share that. 
Thank you both. Any last questions for uh, Ajahn Atsani uh, before we move on? Yes, uh, Professor Olino, let me uh, ask to unmute and see if that works for you. Does that work? I think so. Please, yeah, we can hear you well. Uh, Please great, ahead. thank you. Thank you so much. This is just wonderful and I love the play that you're bringing out. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you could describe any changes to the story itself. Uh, was the Mikado changed or the content of the root text uh, offering something that might say pull the rug out of the assumptions at the heart of the Mikado? Uh, I'm curious about the story and if the way of making it a sermon to be like dharmic content required changing anything of the story. I, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the plot is the same. Plot is the same. Mm -hmm. the plot is the same. And um, I'm not sure if uh, a detail, any detail is changed uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, I, yes, uh, thank you so much for, 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 for the question and I will uh, uh, study in detail about the, 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 the shift in the, in the detail to the Mikado and uh, the, the King translation, the King adaptation. Thank you so much. Yes. Great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you all for your questions and engagement. And thank you again uh, once more to uh, Adan Atsani uh, for that presentation. Again, this is a, a long workshop and Zoom is an exhausting format. So I would like us to take a five minute break here and start again at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, and that's, uh, for those of you in Thailand, that's 12.30 a.m., which is ah, very late at night. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll have a, a presentation by um, Adan Diranai next. So please, please come back to, to, to hear her presentation. I recommend not signing out of the, the Zoom space, but just turning your uh, video off and muting, and we'll start again in, in five minutes. See you soon. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Now we're going to have a presentation by uh, Dr. Diranai Vitikun, and her presentation will be on Siamese Pali language in Mahayutagaravangsa, uh, which uh, she'll introduce us more uh, about the, the nature of, of this quite um, important and fascinating text within the Thai context. Uh, Dr. Uh, Diranai earned her PhD in Pali Sanskrit and Buddhist studies uh, at Tulalongkorn University. Her Thai language dissertation focused on this extremely rare and little studied uh, Pali historical chronicle from early 19th century Siam, namely the Mahayutta Garavangsa, itself based on the Raja Tiraj. Uh, chronicle that more widely circulates in Burmese, Mon, and Thai. At present, uh, she is a lecturer in the South Asian languages uh, section uh, in the Department of Eastern Languages of the Faculty of Arts at Dulalongkorn uh, University, where research interests include uh, Buddhist manuscripts in Thailand, Siamese inflected forms of the Pali language, and the role of Indian mythology in Thai culture. I've really been looking forward to this uh, presentation. And I just from the, the handout and from I, what I know of uh, Dr. Jiranai's work, I know that she's really advancing in specific and particular ways how to understand the Pali compositions produced by uh, Southeast Asian authors. Uh, which has been always a central question in reading and understanding uh, these texts. And now we're getting very specific ways of understanding that. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Jiranai, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. So, uh, today I'd like to uh, present to you all the 
Siamese body language from the Mahai to Garavansa. And before we begin the language session, I'd like to give you a short introduction about uh, what the Mahayuta Garawangsa is, because um, this name is not so well known in the Bali uh, literature studies or the Buddhist studies as a whole. So this is the manuscript of the Mahayuta Garawangsa. Uh, it is a recently discovered manuscript, only discovered just in um, 2015 by uh, Dr. Pira Panarat from Hamburg University. Well, the text here carved in calm script or uh, on the palm leaves, which is the uh, normal manuscript tradition of the Buddhist text uh, of the pre-modern central Thailand, or where I may call here Sayam. And the main text here all in Bali, and with some paratext, as you may see in here, sorry, you may see in here, uh, some paratext is in Thai and some is in Bali. And the whole uh, story of the Mahayuta Garavangsa should be consist of um, 17 fascicles of the palm leaves, but the discovered fascicles, we, we only uh, discovered just four fascicles of the palm leaves. Uh, toward the ends of the story. And from the colophon, we know that uh, the Mahayuta Garawangsa is composed by Somdet Prapon Narat, the wise uh, supreme patriarch of the Siamese court in 1806. It's uh, three years to the end of the reign of the King Rama I in Ratanakosin period. And it's as Dr. Walker said, is a Mon chronicle focused on a Mon king, Raja Di Raja. Uh, you may know him in a more uh, well-known Burmese pron pronunciation as King Yasadayit, or the Thai pronunciation as King Raja Tirat or Prata Raja Tirat. But this king is quite famous for his uh, military affairs with the, the Burmese. So the main story about uh, of the Mahayuta Garawangsa is about uh, the, 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 the military affairs. And as this king is quite uh, popular in mainland Southeast Asia, then we got many uh, versions of his chronicle in many languages. The Burmese, Mon, Thai, and Mahayuta Garawangsa is a Bali version. And this is a work of translation from the Thai language composed earlier. Like uh, the famous Siamese poet, the Zhao Priya Praklang Hun, composed the Thai version in 1785. And 21 years later, Samdit Prapunara just translated into Bali. And many of you may notice here the word Wang Sa. Yes, it's the same. Wangsa as the deeper Wangsa or the Maha Wangsa, the Jula Wangsa. And also it's the same Wangsha in Sanskrit. Uh, the Wangsa in Bali means bamboo or lineage, the family, the dynasty, and is the name of the Shang of the Buddhist literature. Uh, mainly about the historical texts and chronicles and legends of the dynasty. So why? Should a chronicle about a Mon king be uh, counted as one of the Wangsaks? Uh, the author himself answered this question here. This is uh, from Sankitiya Wangsa, uh, the, the other work from the same author. Uh, in his perception, uh, after Buddhism is wiped out of India and Langa, only uh, five or six kingdoms here preserve Buddhism, like uh, Siam, Siam here, or Cambodia, or uh, the, the Burmese kingdom, and here, here. The Hangsa uh, Ramara Rajapadese means the, the kingdom of the Mon. Ramara here means uh, Raman, the Mon people, and 
Pangsa is like a Pangsawati, Pangsawati, the, the other name of uh, the city of Peku, the capital of the Mon. And elsewhere here, Anye Subadese Sunyani, in all other kingdoms, Buddhism is lost. So the chronicle of the Mon, the Demon kingdom, is like the chronicle of the land of the Buddhism. So uh, it should be considered as one of the Wangsa and, of course, one of the Buddhist literatures. So, okay, because Maharaja Garawangsa is composed by a Siamese poet uh, with his native language as Thai or Siamese. So it's not surprising here that uh, um, there are influence of the Thai language appear everywhere in the Maharaja Garawangsa in the orthography, the lexical items and the grammars, or better to say that in every aspect of the language is influenced by Thai. For an example here, the uh, the orthography or the spelling of the word in the Mahai Chikarawangsa, I compare here in the Bali Text Society Dictionary on the left and in uh, uh, the, the, the word, the spelling in Mahai Chikarawangsa on the right. Uh, uh, firstly, I might tell you that uh, Thai language is not used to, to the word with uh, continuous light syllables. So uh, the word here, sutarita, sutarita here, we Thai pronounce it as sutarit, sutarit. Uh, you may notice the heavier syllable here, sutarit, so here and here. Or the word mukha, mukha in Bali, uh, we pr pronounce as a mukha, mukha, with a heavier uh, first syllable instead of the, the two like syllables here. So what the author of the, the Mahayata Karawangsa did is just adding the consonant here, here, and here to uh, make the spelling reflect what he actually pronounced. So, actually, I really love this example here, the mukha and mukha, because like when I first sent the hand out to Dr. Walker and he replied that, are you misspelling something? Because here in uh, Bali, we, normally we got only one K here and I'm like, no, I'm not misspelling anything. <laughs> so moving on, maybe this, uh, the word, what jakutik, what jakutik means toilet, uh, is borrowed into Thai word, wet jakudi, wet jakudi, or maybe in short, uh, wet, wet means also the, the toilet. So, uh, the author of the Mahayata Karawangsa, when he wants to use this uh, this word, well, he he trying to go back into Bali form from Kudi to Kuti, Kuti here. But uh, here, the wow here is changed from uh, the wow up here into it to match the Thai word with or with the Kudi. Or here, there's this um, this word borohita borohita again borrowed into Thai word parohit parohit. So another change here from the wild u u boro boro into the wild a paro, and not forget to add in the consonant here to make the syllable heavier from borohita into Parohita, parohita. And uh, this example, I think, is a very interesting one. Well, uh, there is a word in Bali, kapana, kapana. This word has its Sanskrit form as kalpana, kalpana. And the Thai language just borrowed the Sanskrit form, kalpana, but into the Thai pronunciation, kalapana, kalapana. But when the author wants to use this word, he just used the 
very tight form here and uh, just ignore the, the, the Bali form. Well, he's composing the Bali text here, but yeah, he just used the Thai form, the Thai um, spelling here and like that. So you can see that uh, uh, the vowels or even the syllables can be changed in order to match the pronunciation in Thai. So uh, if you are not so familiar with uh, the, the Thai vocabularies or the Thai pronunciation of Bali words, you may get some, a little bit confused when facing the spelling in the Maha Yutukara Wangsa. And oh, moving on to my most favorite features in Siamese Bali literatures, um, the 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 lexicon, the the vocabularies. I can say that if you read the Mahayagara Wangsa, you may find many, many, many vocabularies that cannot be found elsewhere, like this underlined words here. It's a a a borrowed word from Thai language, and like a. Uh, the author of the Mahayutakara Wangsa from the Praponara just used uh, three methods in borrowing the vocabularies, the loan word, the loan translation, and the loan blend. Uh, for the loan word, like uh, you borrow both the, the meaning and the pronunciation of the word. And the loan translation is like when we when you uh, borrow just the, the, the meaning, but not the pronunciation. And the lone blend here means like uh, it happens when it is a compound word with one part as a lone word and one part as a lone translation. So here's an example. The parangnawa, parangnawa means the foreign ship. Well, nawa is an ordinary Bali word for a ship or a boat, but the word parang here is borrowed from Thai word farang, farang. Well, uh, in Thai nowadays, we still call the the foreigner, especially the Westerner, we call it farang, farang. And uh, some say that this word farang is borrowed from the the word franca, Fran franca. I'm, I'm not sure about this. Is it is it a French word or something? And um, like uh. The word farang in Thai is borrowed into parang, parang in Bali because uh, Bali has no f sound. So it is with a little bit of adaptation, it's changed into parang, parang. So parang nawa here means uh, the farang ship, the, the foreign ship, the westerner ship here. So, and it is the, the uh, example of the, the load where we borrow both the pronunciation and uh, the meaning from Thai words. And here, Well, actually we got the, the in the, the normal Bali language and it means having lifted up. But uh, the word here in Mahayutakara Wangsa is a borrowed word from the word banju or prachu. Prachu. And you may notice that Prachutha and Prachu in Thai, like the sounds quite similar, close to each other. So uh, the word Prachu or Banchu here means uh, to load, to put in or fill. So uh, the Prachutha Petua here, a causative and gerund form, uh, means having loaded, having put in, and this word is used with the cannon. So it means that uh, you loaded the cannon or put the cannonball into the cannon, like this. And another example for the the loan word from Thai. I love this example. Please follow me. Uh, mukatana, mukatana. Well, this mukatana uh, means the the. I'm not sure the terrace behind the wall of the fort or or the city wall. Is it called a battlement? I'm not sure about this. But it's it means something here and here that 
the, the soldier can climb up here and, and fighting with the, the enemies. So uh, here, the place here and here in Thai, we can call, or in Siam, the, the pre-modern Thai, we call this Na Thi Chung Thun, Na Thi Chung Thun, or in short, Na Thi, Na Thi. So uh, the battlement, Na Thi means the battlement. But if we separate this uh, syllables from Na Thi into two separated syllables, we got here Na and T. And Na in Thai is this free morphine means uh, face or front, and T means place. So the author just loaned it, translated it into Na from, from Na into Mukha. Mukha also means face, and T into Tana, which also means place. So from Na Thi, we got here the Mukatana, Mukatana to, to reflect the, 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 the word Na Thi in Thai. <laughs> in the locative from Mukatane, so we find in the text here the, the Mukatane, the battlement, as uh, it's uh, a long translation from the word Na Thi. Or this one, this one. A complicated one, please. Let's let me explain this. First, we got a word uh, to light the fire in Thai. We call dot dot dot, and another word here to come into existence, especially if you are like um, an angel in the heaven in your past life, and you come down to earth, being born in the human world, uh, like this. This word we will use as a dutbe, dutbe. And you may notice here the, the sounds quite close to each other, dut and dutbe. One meaning light the fire and one meaning come to existence. Okay, leave it here. Now come to here, please. Uh, the verb to come to existence in Bali, we use upachati, upachati. Or the German form here, so uh, we have here in the Mahayutakarawangsa the word upachitwa, but with the meaning of lighting the fire. Uh, I found it shocking when I first uh, read to this uh, vocabulary. <laughs> but I swear to you, this is not one of the most extreme cases found in about the, how uh, the author used the vocabularies here. So I may say that um, quite a deep knowledge of Thai language or Thai vocabulary is needed here in order to like uh, catch up with the creativity of the author. So, Moving on to the grammar of the Mahayutakara Wangsa. Well, uh, the grammar is also influenced by Thai language in many aspects, right? Like uh, the modifier in the compound words. Normally, the Bali puts the modifier uh, before the head or, or the main word, but in Thai, we uh, put it after. So in Mahayutakara Wangsa, we got both uh, modifiers, both in uh, in front of and behind the head are the pre-verb and post-verb auxiliaries or the, uh, the active or passive sense in the sentence or here is the SV or, or SOV sentence structures, the syntax, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, this all uh, will not be uh, will not appear in our selected paragraph. So I may need to skip it in for the sake of time limit. And but but I already put some um examples in the handout so you can find it there. Please forgive me about this. And so we're moving on to our um selected paragraph from the Mahayutakara Wangsa. Actually I I, I 
uh, chose the quite a simple paragraph here. So that uh, if uh, anyone don't know Thai or Bali can follow easily. So this is uh, from the chapter that Sumin and Wang Mangsi, the Mon captains preparing for war against the Burmese king. And here, Tangkane parang nawa tatsa udaka mukhe tita. Tangkane at that time, and parang nawa also farang nawa the, the the foreign ship we discussed earlier. Uh, his udaka mukhe. Uh, uh, udaka mukhe. I would say that it's a loan translation from the Thai word pak nam pak nam because udaka means uh water and nam means water and mukhe means uh. Uh, apart from the face, it can also mean the mouth. So in Thai, we have the word "bak now means the the river mouth. Uh, so we, uh, the the city of Sumin Awamangsi is a a port in the Mon country. So uh, he had he's got the the river mouth near his city. So at that time, by that time, there was a foreign ship, a Westerner ship, at his river mouth near the city. We see here the past participle here. Uh, is maybe the newly invented um, samasa, the, the compound word from nawa and nayaka, nayaka of uh, the, the leader, the commander, you know, the ship commander here. Uh, the ship commander was there, patak, was there in the city. Again, we see the, the past participle, tito here. And so Suming so, Awamangsi Inawa Nayakena Mantento. So he Suming Awamangsi consulting with the ship commander, uh, the present participle here. That Dena Eka Wudo Ati or Eka Awudo Ati one weapon. There is one weapon. De Nakare Tito. If it is placed in the city, but we can see that uh, this word is used alternatively between the, the active form and the passive form. So it's one of the, the, the characteristic of the Siamese Bali, I would say, because uh, Thai language has no strict sense of active and passive. So uh, the, the author of this text uses it uh, accordingly. Okay, if uh, there is a weapon, if it is placed in the city, so he took udapadi, things that silat pani, so he took that event, udapadi happen. Well, actually, uh, here is a, a, a verb in an aorist form, but uh, I would say that uh, most sentences in Mahayudhikara was that if uh, the finite verb found would be mostly the um, present simple active. And the most uh, non-finite verb which found would be the, like this, the, um, the past participle or the during, because I think it's the, the verb form that's uh, easily to, to conjugate it. But, but here we still got some some uh, other verb form here like like aorist here or the present participle um in in this this sentence so uh, so here to udapadi if something happened if, if some events happened things that sila pane pane the place in the place of the thirty sila or thirty sen sen here is a a Siamese uh, measurement unit. And one cent is around like 40 meters. So something cent, sorry, uh, the, uh, the, the 30 cents here will be like three quarters of a mile. And something happened within, within the reach of uh, the 30 cent here. Upakarang sitchati, upakarang uh, assistant will be succeeded with that weapon. This uh, something Angwa Mangsi is said to. 
So, Pang Sutawa, uh, having heard that, Sami Amwa Mang Si Tutajito, having uh, the happy heart, he was really glad. And Pang Awudang Aharape Toa, he ordered that weapon to be brought using the, the gerund here, as I've said. Pang Awudang Aharape Toa. Mukatane tapeti and caused that weapon to to be placed at the battlement, <laughs> the battlement here. They uh, not according to the the ship commander has said. So, nawanayako uh, sampati chitwa the ship commander having received that word again the the German here. Mahanta sara aking petutapetwa. Mahantasara aking means uh, the cannon because uh, mahanta means big and sara aking here means the, the gun. Like uh, sara here is uh, the same words as shara in Sanskrit. It means, actually it means the arrow, but uh, the Thai borrow the, uh, the word shara in Sanskrit into son and it means uh, it can mean both the bow and the arrow. So uh, even it says sara here, it means the bow, the fire bow means a gun, and the big gun is the cannon. So here is a I would say is it creativity. I love this. Mahanta uh, sara akin the cannon, but to tapetawa, not lifting up, but loaded the cannon. The cannon with uh, the, the Thai uh, borrow wood from Thai, as we discussed earlier. And Rachu Aking Upachitoa. Rachu means the rope and Aking's fire. So Rachu Aking means the, the fuse of, of the cannon or the gun. And Upachitoa here, light to light, uh, light to light the fire, uh, sorry, light the fuse, already the fuse, and then Patiman and Pit, he waits for the order. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the paragraph and the Mahayutakarawangsa. And I wish that this session uh, can deliver you uh, some sample amusement from the Siamese Bali language and literatures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tiranai, for that really engaging presentation and for bringing out for us the really the joy and the aesthetic pleasures of, of this literature and the creativity uh, behind it. I would love to make room for questions from uh, our participants now. I know you know many of you are specialists in Pali, and we'll we'll have you know fascinating sort of you know, questions and insights to share. Um, so please, if you have a question, just raise your hand or you know, send a message uh, in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting, um, so many questions that I would love to have a chance to, to ask you, Ajahn Tiranai. Uh, let me begin just here with how would you place the Siamese Pali of the Mahayutakaravangsa within the spectrum of other Pali texts composed in Siam. In other words, are the features that you see in this text uh, ones that we see uh, in a particularly extreme form in the Mahayutakaravangsa and say in other compositions by even Somde Praponarat, like in the uh, Sangitiyavangsa, it's not as extreme. Um, if we compare it to uh, various um, Ani Sangsa text composed in, in central uh, Thailand in, in, in earlier centuries. Do we see these same features? How would you put it on the spectrum of all Siamese Pali compositions? I would say that it's in the, the, the middle of the stream here because uh, once I, I read the, the uh, Ayutthaya text, with some many Pali and Sanskrit words. And I found that, oh, many loan translation, many like uh, different 
spelling from from our normal uh, knowledge to Bali, but uh, well, uh, so that Prabhupada is a a teacher of uh, the one very important poet, the Somdet Gromaparamanushit, and actually his Bali, the the the, the Bali work of Somdet Gromaparamanushit, kind of like uh, derived from the work of his teacher. But uh, when the King Rama the Fourth, uh, he like uh, what to say? He uh, changed the, the the how the the Bali language is uh, teach in 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 especially in the in the royal court. This kind of language is, I would say, lost. Yeah, but but like. Yeah, it, I, I would say that it is in the middle of the stream because the uh, the Ayutthayan period, uh, we have very little uh, evidence here because there's no um, research, not so much about the body in the ATR period. But yeah, I think it's it reflects because uh, the the Sundar Prabhupada is also. He he born in a UTR period and he's like he's a wise a supreme patriarch, he's a royal one, so he can he like uh he knows and, and this this uh Bali style, this Siamese Bali should be considered as uh the royal style for a time, but then uh distinguished in uh in in around the time of the King Ramadi Falls, I think. Thank you so much for illuminating that that history for us. That that makes a lot more sense to me in terms of the timeline and how this, that's, this fits in with these variety of styles. So it looks like we have a question here from uh, Professor Lamertz. So I've pressed ask to unmute. Hopefully that works great. Hi, um, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. This is such a wonderful event. Um, and thank you so much for staying up so late to be here. <laughs> um, I guess I guess the question that I have about, um, you know, some of your uh, observations regarding what you're calling Siamese Pali um, relates to, I mean, in this particular context, relates to um, you know, the fact that as far as far as I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I can tell, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a sole witness to this text, right? You only have one manuscript, or at least that was yes. my impression from, okay, so, you know, it's, you know, and, and I, you know, have occasion to deal with these kinds of problems a great deal as well, um, just in the context of Burmese manuscripts. But, you know, when we only have a single witness, it's kind of hard to pass judgments, um, you know, relating to or make determinations relating to, um, you know, the, the character of, let's say, something like the orthography in the original, when, you know, it strikes me that some of these phenomena that you're, you know, hinting at, I mean, it may not be the case, but some of these phenomena, you know, this wecha kudi, for example, I mean, you know, this, this might be an artifact of the transmission, right? I mean, this could be, could be an effect of, you know the the scribal copying. I mean, there there are, there are a number of other potential um, you know sort of explanations for for these phenomena that that you know that you know don't necessarily mean that we have to jump to a conclusion that I mean I get your point about the novel lexicon and poly words are constantly being invented and reinvented and so on and so forth. But when we get into the into the domain of sort of like, you know, really truly variant orthography that, you know, is indeed a misspelling. You know, it strikes me that, you know, the, the kind of, you know, easier explanation for these phenomena is to, is to, is to think in terms of, of, you know, certain types of things that just happen in the transmission of this kind of textual material, right? So I'm, I'm curious about your, your, your thoughts on this and whether you would just sort of say, no, I don't think that's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a scribal error or something, you know, something along those lines. So, but um, anyway, thank you so much. It was really terrific, magnificent talk. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm still, uh, I think that is me. I would still call this the, the Siamese Bali spelling because not, uh, okay, I, I deal with my specific manuscript here of the Maha Ayutthaya Bangsa, but uh, also the the other words of the of the same author, like uh, he, he has uh, the Jula Yutakara Wangsa, the Sankitiya Wangsa, and uh, the work, the Bali work in composed in Lanna or Northern Thailand, uh, like the the Jamatevi Wangsa or the Chinakan Malini, uh, they all have the same features of a spelling that uh that that reflects the thai pronunciation instead of uh the the like the langan bali here so i would say that uh even the the maharajikara i had only one manuscript here but we can uh see the the evidence uh in in other texts and other manuscripts Thank you very much. Other other questions uh, that others uh, present would like to, to ask to Ajahn Diranai. Uh, yes, it looks like we have a question from uh, Veng Hua. Let me uh, press unmute. Does this work? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Go. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, hello, Ajahn and every members of this meeting. It's really great to be a part of this um, session to study like the history of bilingualism. And for me, uh, I'm a student from the University of Trinity, uh, from Trinity College in Connecticut, and I am Cambodian. And um, it's also very interesting to realize that in uh, the Mahayun uh, Yutaka Vamasa, uh, it's like I can uh, recognize that those Bali Sanskrit and characters is still being is what we use today in our language, and um, and it's also very interesting to see how um, in your research you try to understand the Bali um, language written on that uh, palm leaves and and how is it in the connection with the Thai language today and and then, then which leads you to like discover new terms in there and stuff however i'm wondering that in your journey of studying the text um have you ever tried um um studying other languages like for example khmer um who still use those letters that i still recognize in the text to better understand the meaning or the the meaning behind those words in the in the text itself and um yeah so that's my question uh yes i did study khmer also with Adan Tosapun here we are in the same class in the the uh undergraduate time well very long time ago but yeah i'm sorry that i remember very little bit of it yeah but uh i for, for the Khmer, uh, the Qom script here, I would, sorry, I need to hear as it very nice. Uh, this kind of uh, looks very, is it uh, the, actually the same one as you use in Cambodian today or a little bit different? I guess the latter. Um, so this kind of uh, calm script is like uh, preserved in the central Thailand and used in the, the, the Buddhist text manuscript, many of it. So, so like uh, to, to uh, study the, the manuscript in the, especially the Buddhist manuscript in, in central Thailand, in pre-modern central Thailand, you need to uh, study the, the script, this, Cambodian style script as the com script will so. Thank you. If I could add one thing here, and this is sort of related to Ving Hua's question as well. Thinking about, I, lo I love all the different examples that you brought out around uh, different uh, different 
borrowed uh, words and these kind of loan word translations. You know, one that that stood out to me was this uh, the the Pali um, absolute of uh, uh, which also has this causative formation in it, having cause to put in. Um, and the particular Thai word that it's translating, manchu, in this case, is a Thai word that comes from from Khmer. Uh, the Khmer sort of root of the word jo means to descend, to go down, and then it has this causative prefix, the pa uh, prefix. Uh, so manchu in Khmer that has the sense of to to load, in the, in the same kind of senses mm -hmm. as manchu in Thai. So it's interesting that this causative uh, grammatical structure that's in the Khmer root of the word gets carried over into the Pali translation as well. Um, it looks like we have a question uh, here oh, from yeah. Khun Kittipong, but if you wanted to respond to anything first, uh, Ajahn Tiranai. I guess I might go back to my Khmer lessons. <laughs> here, so, thank you very much, Dr. Walker. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, uh, Ajahn Kittipong, can you hear us? Uh, okay. yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's very uh, fascinating, like the talk today. It's, it's, it's kind of like uh, a shame that I am Thai, but I don't really know much about this. But uh, my, my question is just like, I want to refer back to uh, Ajahn Asani's talk about um, his, his study. And also Ajahn Jill and I talk today. I, I, I wonder, like, do we see any same kind of... Um, Pali, pseudo Pali, or something like that in, in Ajahn uh, Asani's uh, text or not? Like, because it's the same uh, translation, I think, uh, do we see the same thing like that? Because, like, Ajahn Tira and I just said that um, when we see that in, in, in other Siamese or like Lana's uh, text, but I'm not sure if we see that in Ajahn Asani's text or not, with, because it's probably later or something. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, my question. <laughs> Uh, please. Um, thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, I think the Pali text in the Mikado, the Tesanarini Tamikatra, is like a, uh, the uh, classical Pali or the, 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 uh, the Sri Lankan Pali. Or, uh, I, I, I don't find any a uh, Pali Thai style in 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 the in the Pali text composed in uh, the Tesanarini Kamikatura. Yes, but I'm not sure uh, if Ajahn Jira and I read, <laughs> uh, have a chance to read the text. She he you uh, identify. Oh, this one is the Pali Thai style. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, yes, well, because the, uh, maybe yes. because uh, Ajahn Asani's text is uh are uh, like like I said is after the, the reign of the King Rama the Fourth that uh, has a revolution in in uh, Bali education, Bali language education. So maybe uh, the 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 king or his man there has the, the new way to educate it in Bali language. I see no uh, things like in my text as uh, Adan Asani presented. But uh, I would I would not call that uh, pseudo Bali here because but I would call it as Siamese Bali or local Bali instead because um, my uh, personally I think that uh, it is us the academics who standardize the Langan Bali and makes that uh, oh this is a standard and not uh, if if it doesn't meet the standard it's just like a pseudo things so. I would um, mention the, the 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 local Bali here. Thank you. All right. Th thank you very much. Yes, that is very interesting. Is when when we see like this kind of uh like like the the two lines between uh something before the systemization or uh in, in Thailand and and uh, yeah like the um local local uh, localized Bali in in Thailand before that time. Yes. Th thank you very much. Very fascinating. Thank you. 
So let me echo that thanks for uh, Atan Kiranai. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in the name of time, I would like us to now move on to our last presentation by Atan Totopon Sipum. And because of the way we've had these, I think, wonderful discussions after each uh, talk, um, uh, Atan Totopon, if this is okay with you, we'll, we'll also have that after yours. And then I think we'll be out of time for the event as a whole. Um, so we won't have the sort of general discussion, but if you have you know, general questions you want to ask also after um, Ajahn Totopon's question uh, presentation, we'll, we might have a little bit of time for that. We don't want to go over because it will be 2 a.m. Uh, in, in Thailand, uh, but thank you very much uh, to, uh, to the three of you for, for again, for, for staying up for uh, our unofficial caffeine and adrenaline sponsors that are making this possible. And uh, without further ado, let me uh, say a few words about uh, Ajahn Tosupon uh, before he begins his presentation. So um, uh, Dr. Tosupon uh, completed his PhD uh, at uh, Tulalongkorn University from the Department of Thai in the Faculty of Arts. His dissertation, Bot Le Te Mahachat, in contemporary Thai society roles and significance as ritual literature, also in Thai, concerned the melodic recitation of local vernacular language episodes of the Vasantara Jataka in modern day Thailand. He was recently appointed a uh, lecturer in the Department of Thai Faculty of Arts at um, Sinlapakon uh, University. And topics explored in his current research include the dynamic interactions between ritual and literature, the changing nature of oral traditions, and also sensory studies of uh, folklore and literary texts. And it's this, this latter research interest that I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about, not in, in this presentation, but in other uh, projects that Ajahn Totopon is working on. And I think he's making a, a, a really you know, innovative contribution to the study of visuality and also thermal sensation in, in Buddhist texts. So looking forward to learning uh, more about that. For now, um, let's uh, welcome him uh, for uh, his, uh, his talk on the Teet Mahachat and this relationship between textuality and or orality. So the floor is yours, uh, Ajahn Tosupon. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, you can hear my voice clearly, right? Yep, the screen is great and we can hear you very clearly. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, good day, everyone. It, it is almost 2 a.m. here in Thailand. So uh, I must apologize in advance if my bad English reaches the level unintelligible. Okay, firstly, I want to express my gratitude to the whole Center for Buddhist Studies. Uh, it is truly my honor to be in this workshop. Also, my gratitude to Dr. Trent Walker. Uh, since the time we share reading ancient Thai literature here in Thailand, you have given me, given me many opportunities to explore and learn new things about Buddhist and Thai literatures. And my talk today might never see the light of the day, or in this case, the light of the night, without your advice and encouragement. Okay. Uh, the topic of my talk today is functions of Pali Kata and the interplay between textuality and orality in Tate Mahasha. Uh, this talk actually stems from my PhD dissertation on Ted Mahashat in 2019. However, my dissertation focuses more on the Thai portion of Ted Mahashat text and its use in a ritual context. In this talk, I will shift my focus to the Pali Kata, which is a smaller and a less significant portion of the text yet, despite its small portion, Pali Kata is still indispensable for Ted Mahasha ceremony. Uh, the key message of my talk today is that the oral and performative aspects of the recitation have added several new functions to the Pali Kata in Ted Mahasha text. From my studies, there are four prominent functions. The first one is that Pali Kata works as a marker for intra-episode content separation. The second is that it works as a marker for melody changes 
The third is it works as a sacred symbol for the ritual. And the last one is that it works as a key element to the recitation techniques. Now to deliver this key message, I plan my talk with the uh, two parts. Firstly, I will uh, we would take a bit of time to make acquaintance with the Tet Mahasha ceremony. Uh, in this part, uh, I will include basic information about the Tet Mahasha and also some examples of the functions I've mentioned. In the second part, I will focus on how Pali Kata functions in Tet Mahasha and some aspects of the interplay between textuality and, in tet, uh, and orality in Tet Mahasha which are the main factors that give the new function to the Pali Kata. Here we begin with the first part. Uh, in this part, Meli aims to answer two questions. The first one is, what is Tet Mahasha? And the second one is, what does Tet Mahasha text look like? Most of the part, uh, most of this part, uh, will aim to help some one of you, some of you who might have never heard of this ceremony before. Uh, but for those who, have, who might be familiar with this Thai popular ceremony, I hope some information derived from my uh, PhD dissertation's findings might help you to have a new look at this complex and dynamic ritual. For the first question, I will start with the name of the ceremony, Thet Mahasha. In Thai, the word Mahasha derives from the Pali word Mahasati. It literally means a great birth, and in Thai culture, it, this word, this word exclusively refers to the West and Rajadaka. And the word te derives from the uh, from Pali Tesana. In Thai, it means to recite or to preach. Uh, overall, te Mahashat means to recite or the recitation of the story of West and Rajadaka. This special preaching ceremony is centered on monks reciting the Tet Mahasha. It is a story about Prince Vesantra, the Bodhisattva who dedicated to the perfection of giving or Dhanaparami. However, Prince Vesantra is exiled from the city because he has donated the city's important elephant. He travels to Kaowongkot or the Maze Mountain in the far, far beyond forest. He is followed by his wife, Madhi, or Matsi in Thai, his son, Jali, or Charlie in Thai, and his daughter, Ganha. The climax of the story happens when Prince uh, Vesantara gives away his children to the old Shujaka or Chuchok, a beggar Brahmana. After the heartbreaking parting, Prince Vesantara reunites with his family and returns to his city to live happily ever after, and that concludes the story. Now, uh, in the actual recitation, the story will be separated into 13 kanda or kan in Thai, or it means uh, 13 episodes. The table on the screen now shows a schedule of one Tet Mahasha ceremony in Bangkok in uh, 2018. This schedule is separated into two days. The upper column uh, represents the first day, which shows the uh, first six episodes. I will uh, like here, the first six episode, and the uh, uh, lower column represent the second day and the rest of them, the seven, the seven uh, last seven episodes. Each episode will take one hour. This is uh, quite a standard uh, period of Tet Mahasha nowadays. And there will be one month to recite for each Kanda. So there will be uh, around 13 months to uh, attend this ceremony. Now I want you to check. Uh, I want you to take a look at the first column, at the first sale here. Oh, sorry. Here, uh, this one is written, Gan Katha Pan, or the episode of One Thousand Katha. It is an extra session for a monk to recite all the Pali Katha of the Sandrashataka. Uh, this number 1000 session is a tradition widely practiced in central Thailand and even in, in uh, local, like in northern Thailand and in Isan and northeastern Thailand. Since it serves the core belief of Tet Mahasha, that is Kati Katha Pan, or the belief of 1000 Katha. Now, the belief of 1000 Katha 
derives from the story of Pramalai. It says that those who listen to all of the 1000 kata and make merits while listening to the recitation will receive a great reward. The result of this merit will help the listener to reborn in the age of the Maitreya or the future Buddha after uh, the origin of the Buddhism of uh, this uh, the present Buddha, the Kautama, has gone. And the age of Maitreya also believed to be a utopian world. So this is quite a, a great uh, and a very promising, uh, like a promised land in, in Christians. And this belief is a main, uh, the, uh, the one of the main reason for Pali, of, for Pali Kata significance. And indeed, its foremost function in Tet Mahashat as, uh, as well. Now, we come to the second question. What does Tet Mahashat text look like? Or what does Mahashat text look like? If you look at each portion of Mahashat text, the innermost will be the Pali verses from Vesandra Shataka in Divinaka. And then there is the prose portion from the Atakatha, Shataka Takatha, or Vesandra Shataka or uh, the commentary of Vesandra Shataka, which, uh, which is composed of both verses from the Divinaka and the prose that has been written later. And then the last one is Thai version of the two former Pali texts, the Thai, the Thai translation of the two former, which is the largest portion in the text. It should be noted that Mahasha text is not a word to call just one specific word. Uh, it is a generic name used to call various versions of the translation of the Sindrajataka. Many poets might compose their own version and use it in their affiliated temples or in their communities. So before the printing technology and the concept of Ponchaba or the original work came to Thailand around uh, the late 19th century, uh, there are many Mahashat more than we could imagine just for one story. This is an example of what Mahashat text looks like. Uh, this excerpt is quoted from Raya Mahavesandron Chadu, or uh, as I translated uh, down below, composed in Raya verse for the, of the great of the great uh, Vesandra Shataka. It, this one is a standard version for Mahasha text in Central Thailand nowadays. There are three parts that I want you to look at. The first one is the normal letter here. Uh, the normal letter here. Uh, these long passages are the Thai, uh, Thai translation. And the second part is the bold letter here. This is an example of a Pali Kata. This is normally quoted before the Thai translation. In this example, the Kata read a small meaning, a hermitage. It follows by a, a Thai description of hermitage immediately. Uh, it describes how beautifully this hermitage is uh, built. Yeah. Then the orange word. And furthermore, there are uh, other components are worth noticing. The first one is the orange word. Uh, this one is the name of the melody that must be used for this passage. It's, it is a marker for melody used here. And then the other line word at the end of the passage, it is an ending marker for the passage. So these four parts are fundamental component of Mahashatik as you might know that text. Now, yeah, I want to explain the word lang a bit more yeah, because the last one you see, uh, the last part, the, the ending marker is great nan la or nan la. Yeah. yeah, I want to talk about the, that, this word a little bit more. Uh, la. This word has two meaning. Firstly, this word is used to call the, uh, the recitation style unique to Central Thailand. Secondly, it is used to call a small section of a text which in a particular gun or particular episode that ends with the word la, like I have shown you. This word is an important word because it is used, frequently used among the monks reciters to identify a part 
they would recite. For example, La Yanawa, we have the word La uh, in front of the, the name or the, the word that describes the, the content of the, of the section. Uh, for example, La Yanawa or the La of the ship. It is the section where Prince Vesendara calls upon his children and encourage them to come out of it of their hiding and let him give them away to Shushok or Shushaka. Only by this way, he will complete his perfection of giving and become the sacred ship that would bring all beings to the Nirvana. You will see that the main metaphor here is the comparison uh, to bringing all beings to the Nirvana, like a bit of ship. So uh, the name of the, this section also adopt this uh, main metaphor here. Moreover, each kanda or each episode has a different number of legs. For example, Kumara Kanda, the episode where Prince Wes and Dora gave away his children to Shushok, has 22 legs. But Sakaparova or Sakabab, the episode where Prince Wes and Dora gave away his wife, has 13 legs. Now, before we move to the main point of the talk, we need to know about another important aspect of Tet Mahasha, that is Tamnong Mahasha or Mahashat melodies. This recitation ceremony is well known for its memorable melodies. These melodies will be noted in the text as I've shown you, and each melody is used differently depending on the type of the passage, such as narration or conversation of the characters or the emotional balance of the story, such as sad, frightening, angry, or some, or some sort. And each ganda or each episode also has their own tone and rhythm. For example, uh, a slow and soothing melody in Tana Ganda. Now I want I'm to shake if I can share a sound here, okay? Uh, this part that I would uh, demonstrate to you when, is when King Sanchaya, the father of Queen Vesantara, begs Masi not to follow her husband and remain into the city. Now you will hear that is quite a uh, long ring, uh, quite quite longing to to the to the her his daughter in laws. Now there is another melody that is vibrant and rough tone. Uh, this melody came from uh, comes from Maharaja Kanda that shows the difficulty it uh, it used in the description of the forest that Chu Shok traveled after received uh, both children of Prince Santara. <laughs> Ah, okay. Uh, this melody is quite memorable, mesmerizing for 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 all who uh, acquaintance and who familiar with the Tet Mahasha. Now we come to the second part of the talk. In this part, I will discuss functions of Pali Kata in Tet Mahasha. We begin uh, with the function as a marker for intra episode content separation. As I have shown you, a section in one episode usually begins with Pali Kata. For example, these two examples from different Kanda share the same pattern that is to begin with Pali Kata and followed by Thai. Translation. The first one is from uh, the first layer of Danakanda. Put Sati Piko Te Ewi Pangna Sum De Paraput Sati Si Sum Parara Atumanda. Now the second one came uh, comes from the third layer of Mahavanakanda. 
รามเมตุกรมหาพระมพรหมบุตรบัณฑชาชาติจงคำพิสัย So uh, though it has a different tone, a different uh, melodies, the pattern is still the same. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm not sure if I can explain these points clearly uh, as as clear as Dan t r e n t or j e r e m i a h a n a s m i but I believe this feature derives from the Thai monastic translation style, which is called p l a y o k s a or to translate the quoted words. Uh, This is basically a textual tra tradition that comes along with the Buddhist scholastic system in Thailand. In my opinion, uh, this, tra uh, this tradition aims to keep the Pali text accurately. However, it also influenced the oral tradition deeply as well. And as I mentioned, that in the past Thailand has many version s of m a h a s h a t Composed by different poets from different times. In these versions, I find that they also have different number of l a y or the uh, number uh, different number of sections. For example, the standard k u m a r a k a n d a in Raya m a h a s a n d a n Chado has 72 l a y but some version might have more or fewer numbers. What does it mean? It means that the separation of the intra-episode contents of each version is also varied. However, despite these differences in lay number, some popular lay always start the same, especially the lay that begins with a distinct Pali kata. For example, lay s u p r i y e from uh, Maharaja Kanda and lay Yanawa from Kumara Kanda. Why? Why I why I mentioned that it must be a distinct palikata because most of the lay usually begins with k i k k a w a y or p o t i s a t p o t i s a t o or some sort the, the the word that used to invoke the, the listener of the Buddha. But these two words, uh, like suriye, it is a word to use describe the time when c h u c h a k a travels to the forest in. Uh, At the end of the day, it start like s u r i n a y a m u r a s u r i y o n It follows by the translation when described that sun is going down. The second function also relates to the first function. Because not only the most of the passage of m a h a s h a t e x t usually begin with Pali kata, most of them also have melodic markers, as I have shown in, in the orange in the orange word. Hence, some of the kata are remembered as a marker for melodic change as well. Some of the Pali kata uh, is widely remembered as a marker for specific melody. One special case, and this is very interesting, is a section that begin with kata p a r a t a w a s h o It comes from uh, the Mahavana Kanda. Uh, this kata becomes the name of the melody tam nom pa. Now you will see that there is a harmony between the first syllable of p a r a t a w a s h o and the word pa here. Uh, This kata is found in Mahavana Kanda, which Chuchok uh, Chuchaka travels to the forest close to the Prince with Sandra c h a t a k a The O Brahmana Chuchok has tricked the, an ascetic living in the forest to tell him the way to Prince with Sandra Hermitage. So the content of this kanda of Mahavana Kanda is mainly about the ascetic bringing Chuchok into the forest to show the way. And the word p a r a t a w a s h o that has a harmony with the word pa. In Thai, it means to bring or to accompany with someone. What is more interesting is that the monk reciter in the past connect this harmony, the p a r a t a w a s h o and the word pa, and develop it into another melody that is not included in the traditional uh, Mahasat melody. 
this mel new, new melody is used to recite another type of Mahasha text that I did not include in, the, in today's talk. The example of Tamnong Pa is like this. Katan to to tati to o tai i tau if you if you uh, will verse in, in Thai in Thai verse in Thai poetry, you will notice that the meter that used in this in this type of layer is different from from the one that I have recited to from Raya my lesson on shadow. Uh, but it's out of our, our limit today, so I will have to skip this. If you are uh, interested, you can look it more into my thesis and dissertation, but okay, unfortunately, it's in Thai. The third function is Palikata as a sacred symbol of the ritual. As I have mentioned that the belief of Pantasan Kata is the core of the ceremony, listening to Palikata recitation is an important ritual act. Apart from the special session of 1000 kata reciting, as I, uh, as I mentioned before, there is another practice that represents an attempt to follow this belief. That is the Junayabot, or the recitation of Junayabot. Junayabot is a brief, a brief portion of kata that plays it in the beginning of each kanda. Before begin every kanda recitation, the monks reciters need to recite this part with a specific melody of that kanda too. Okay. This practice is embedded in the oral tradition so deep it stems into a new interpretation of the kata because I find I found some monks call them call this Junaniyabot as Toraniyabot or to translate into English is threshold text because they they look at this passage, they look at this uh, portion of Pali Kata, and they think of it as a passage or a door before passing into the actual recitation. So from my experience in the field work, I, most of the audience would palm their hand together to show respect after hearing the recitation of the Yabot. So at this point, the Pali also work as a sacred symbol that marks the beginning of the ritual. Here, uh, I may uh, share you a little bit of how the Junayabot is recited here. This is from Mahavana Kanga. <laughs> And for the last function, in some passage, some Pali Kata are deliberately quoted for recitation techniques. This case is appeared in the excerpt of the Anaganda in, in the hand I have, uh, I have sent to you. Here I will. You will see in this, in this excerpt that the bold words, the bold phrases are Pali. There are quite, uh, have a consistent consistent insertion here. And if you listen to how the monks recite this one, you will understand that it is deliberately inserted for the sake of aesthetics. Right. 
ขดชะสันเจ็ดร้อยเนี่ยดูเป็นโนชิสเตอร์เมลดี้เชงจะเสียสัมพันลังการะปุสิเตระดับทาพรหูหอยหูดูเฉิดชายดาราลายรัตกะพนทองตาขายครองปกกระพองหัตถีขามมณีเยพิมีนายหัตถาจารย์ขึ้นขีประจำคอมือถือขอคำดำสวนคดชะสานแต่ละตัวนั้นเรียวแรงร้ายคำรนมาตั้งเค Uh, what I want you to look at is, uh, you will see that these phrases in in this passage is longer than the, the common or the, the general Pali word inserted to into the beginning of of the passage. Okay, so here we will see we will end of my uh, presentation. In conclusion. As we have seen, Pali Kata become the less significant portion of the Mahasha text. It is apparently. Uh, however, the main factors that make Pali Kata still indispensable is the tradition, a traditional belief in the ritual, and the nature of the tradi oral tradition itself. And we also see that besides the, its status as a sacred language and the origin of the story, Pali Kata is. In Mahasha text, also functions as reciting device and narrative devices. This show that the interplay between textuality and orality that makes Pali Kata a dynamic component in Thai peace culture, and also it shows the dynamics of by text in use in Thailand as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ajahn Tosafon, for that that wonderful uh, presentation. And you are always so modest, but uh, uh, I think all of us feel so fortunate to hear your just gorgeous voice bringing uh, these texts uh, to life for us, which provides such an extra dimension when understanding the performance of the genre that you so carefully analyze for us. So thank you very much for that. We have about 10 minutes left in our whole event. And we have time for, for questions uh, for uh, Ajahn Tosupon at this time. So if any of you would like to uh, ask any uh, uh, questions uh, that are you know, coming up at this time, uh, here, here's a good chance. I will go ahead with a question of my own. And this is a question for you, uh, Ajahn Tosupon, as well as for Ajahn Diranai and uh, Ajahn Atsani. And that is the meaning of this term, Juniyabod uh, or Juniyapoda. Uh, it seems like the root of this is related to Pali verbs like Vichuneti, uh, which, uh, or Juna, um, in other words, to, to crush, to smash into pieces. Uh, juna also being a word for powder. Um, is that the sense of this term uh, uh, Juniyabot? And then also I, I love this, uh, the way it gets reinterpreted as Toranibot uh, as a kind of threshold kata as, as well. So I'm, I'm just curious from, from all of you how you might interpret the various senses of Juniyabot here. I might answer from my, my point of view that I have I interviewed many Hmong reciters and, and those who have studied, uh, like Le Paolo, who has uh, taught before. Uh, in their opinion, they never mentioned this, this passage or this, this kind of text in, in terms of like Pali analysis or language analysis like that. But they believe that, uh, like, Many Thais who uh, have faith in the sacredness of Pali, 
So they think of it as like what Y crew, but I don't know how to translate it. Maybe you can translate it. But Y crew on invocation. Invocation, invocational uh, yes. praise or to teachers and ancestors. Yeah. Yes. Invocation to, to the teacher because uh, one mom just uh, has said to me that uh, the way he, he recites this kata is to give respect to the teach the teacher and among teacher who teaches this kanda the recitation of this kanda to to him. So that that is a quite a, like a false belief about this this passage this kind of text. Oh, fascinating! Thank thank you so much. Uh, Ajahn Kilanai and Ajahn Atsani, did you want to add anything? Uh, I'm sorry, I think I don't think I have comment about this. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, I, I, when I was a student, um, uh, I, I remember that I I read an explanation about Junaniya book, and the explanation is uh, that uh, Junaniya book is the short prose that uh, is recited before a Pali short prose that is used uh, before the, the re before reciting uh, the, the Mahacha. So and I. I remember I, I, I used to <coughs> when I when I read uh Lankara Mantri and uh, it is said uh, somewhere that Junaniya uh, means uh, the prose. So it is possible that uh, is it possible that Junaniya what means uh, uh, originally means the prose or the Pali prose. Uh, that is used to recite at the beginning of, of the chapters or of the Gandhas. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, my explanation is correct or not. <coughs> sorry. No, thank, thank, thank you so much. And sorry to put you on the spot at 1.54 AM. So thank you. Other questions for Ajahn Tosopon on his presentation? Yeah, I have read it. Uh... I have described it in, in my thesis, uh, but I can briefly explain about it. Uh, in the past, the monk usually, as I'm trying how to say it, factor. I'm not sure in this context. Please. Uh, I have to do the. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, the, 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 me, the student will go to the teacher and ask them to. to to teach them by living with, with the teacher and uh, like to serve them and then he sometimes he will give them a lesson or two before and in, in case of Ted Mahashat, the monk teacher will start by let them uh, as, as I said wa namo or tang namo ha or wa namo or to recite the, the I'm not sure in English the, to recite the phrase of homage, the, the five phrases of homage. Ah, yes, okay. And uh, it goes like this. You will, like, the norm, normally you pray for in this, this, this kata. Namo tasa pakavato arahato samma samputasa namo tasa pakavato arahato samma samputasa. Yeah, like this. You will go like this. Namo tasa pakavato arahato samma samputasa namo tasa pakavato arahato samma samputasa. And the teacher will let the uh, student repeat after him, and he will check until the, uh, the student could imitate him perfectly. And then he will, uh, and then if the uh, student if uh, do well, uh, he they will proceed to the Jumaniya board. And after the Jumaniya board, uh, and, and as, as I said, uh, each Jumaniya board has a specific melody 
added to that kanda. So the student will learn uh, the melody, that the melody that we use to entire portion as well. And for example, uh, if they finish the Junniya Bot part, they will start and they will begin by reciting or imitating how the teacher start the first layer. Like uh, in, in Tanakanda, they will start from and then they will go layer by layer until they finish all of them. And, that, and I, I think that's, that's the basic uh, training. But uh, there may, may be some special training for, for a special kan that has a difficult, a difficult uh, part of difficult melody. For example, in the end, at the end of Kurmara uh, Kanda that I have put in the excerpt as well, the, there is a melody called Kunsu. Uh, from the excerpt I, I show you, Honto Tewa Sankayo, if you use a very high voice. Honto Tewa Sankayo, Kata Tepida Tao, Tangla, and Saksis Tepida, Lada one. It is a lot of, of strain and technique and like. A lot of practice before it is it so this kind of spatial melody will be separated into another session and that is and that is all that's all that's the process I, I think it's the basic thing thank thank you so much and uh, thank you andrew dade for that question as as well about the the training of this style of chanting and recitation so ajan tozupon thank you so much for bringing that out so clearly for us with those examples. So we are truly now at the end of our, our time for this workshop. I want to thank the uh, Dr. Irene Lin and Stephanie Lee of the Ho Center for, for Buddhist Studies for making this possible. Um, again, grateful for the, uh, the funding provided through the, this uh, TT and WF Chow uh, series of conferences and workshops. Uh, that again made our time together uh, today possible. And of course, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Atsani Punrak, uh, to Dr. Diranai Vititkun, and to uh, Dr. Tsosupon Sipum for your fascinating, engaging presentations, for being willing to share your handouts with us uh, ahead of time and for making this such an, an engaging uh, time for all of us. Thank you for your attention, uh, for your, your questions. And um, I, this has been recorded and will be eventually available uh, online. And uh, I'm glad that you know, the work that you've all done here will be you know, available to a larger audience through, through that as well. So my, my deepest thanks uh, to the three of you. Thank you.